I noticed that I still have time from the previous speaker. Is that my time? Do I get to keep that time? I'm hoping I do. I'm so excited to be here. Um, Traverse City is an amazing city, and to be part of the TEDx Forum is um, a highlight of my career. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the future, but I want to back up and tell you a little bit about my twin sister. My twin sister and I are as close as two twins can be. And several years ago, she had this horrendous idea about getting a fortune-telling reading. I did everything I could to talk her out of it. I thought it was a horrendous idea for lots of different reasons. But there was a small part of me that was afraid. I was scared that this reading would reveal something that she didn't really want to know. And she said it was way overthinking it. It was, you know, it was overreacting as usual, that this was just for fun. She didn't really believe in tarot card readings or fortune telling, but she thought she'd give it a try. And to appease me, she would ask the psychic to only tell her the good stuff. So we go to the tarot card reading, and everything's going okay, it's entertaining, it's engaging, and then the death card is revealed. And my twin sister, who said this was all fun and games, comes completely unglued. This whole idea about it being, you know, fun and not really mean anything, it's all out the door. And she is convinced that this is a bad omen, an ominous sign of things to come. I spent the rest of that day trying to convince her that she would be fine. And indeed, I'm pleased to report that in the days, the weeks, the months, even the years, her life was uneventful. So the card turned out to mean nothing. But when I think back on that day, I couldn't shake the feeling that somehow we had done something wrong, that the unknown was better left unexplored, and we had brought this drama on ourselves. In fact, I went so far as to declare that the future was something I never wanted to know. Didn't want to know good, bad, indifferent. The future was a mystery, and it should be kept that way. It was probably about five years later that I actually found myself working as a professional futurist. So it's really unlikely beginning um, for someone in my position. I've worked for Ford Motor Company for 16 years, and the last eight has been as the in-house futurist. And so I've gotten over my fear of the unknown, and I rather enjoy exploring it. Uh, of course, I can't predict the future any more than that so-called psychic could. But it's tempting to try. Every single person in this room has attempted to predict the future, whether you realize it or not. When you book a, a plane ticket, when you plan a vacation, when you put together a business plan or some sort of long-term strategy, you're building that plan on a set of assumptions. Assumptions about how you think the future is going to unfold. And most times, this is completely unconscious. We never think about the future. We don't question it, so we assume everything is going to go just as we plan. But what if it doesn't? What if everything that you believe to be at the, about the future is wrong, that it turns out to be quite different? You can't hide yourself from the future. And most people don't like to think about it because we don't have the tools to deal with uncertainty. We don't know, we don't want to think about the bad stuff. And sometimes it's too um, difficult to even hope for the good stuff. But I think it's important to think about the future. And you can do this by thinking about the possibilities, the way things can go right, the way that things can go wrong. A best case scenario, worst case scenario, the countless scenarios in between present a wide range of possibilities. But you have to start by thinking about the many things that you can't control, the things that are beyond your influence, the big picture things, social, technological, economic, environmental, and political arenas. It often surprises people when I tell them that I have nothing to do with cars. Actually, I'm not a car person, which is really unlikely for someone who works in the automotive industry, because we have plenty of experts that are passionate about cars. I know that a number of the people in this room are from Haggerty. They probably share the same passion and, and automobiles. And so they don't need to be taught more about cars. They need to be taught about things that are outside their scope. When you're moving too fast, when we're given a task, and we're so focused on that, we forget to look at the world around us and the things that can throw our plans off track. So I do this a couple different ways. I do it by identifying and tracking global trends. And again, they're, they're in these five categories, the social, technological, economic, environmental, and political arenas. And it's ironic that my title is this futurist because I spend most of my time reminding people that no one can predict the future. So you have to think about multiple futures. And when you explore these multiple futures, it can be really liberating because you'll never know exactly how the future is going to unfold, but you'll be better able to anticipate and prepare for the future because the key is to learn the unexpected, to become comfortable, you know, to, to expect the unexpected. 
So these scenarios that I talk about, they're literally stories, fiction. Once upon a time in the future, the world looked like A, B, C, or D. But these stories can be extremely powerful because they allow people to imagine a future that otherwise has been unimaginable to them at this point. But you're trying to get them to change their worldview, so it's a little bit more difficult than that. The stories have to be provocative, but plausible. And so while they're fiction, they're based on fact. And so these facts come from trends, and I'd like to share with you a couple collections of stories that I've been running, that have been running through my head. Um, they're not finished. They don't have a clear beginning, middle, or end. But they can inform our view of the future. So we're going to approach this through three lenses. And the first view is the big picture, if you will, the 100,000 foot view of the, what the world or the future might look like. So today there are 7 billion people in the world. That number is expected to grow somewhere between 9 and 10 billion in the next couple of decades. By 4050, we'll be somewhere between 9 and a half and 10 billion people. The world has never seen a population of that size before. Clean drinking water issues aside, climate change, global warming, there's just a more fundamental issue about the carrying capacity of the planet. Will there be enough food for everyone? Well, one Harvard-based professor, E.O. Wilson, says that we should be okay. There are about three and a half billion acres of land on which to build food, and that's plenty to fill 10 billion people. But only if every single one of us agree to become a vegetarian. If we don't, over the long term, it might only feed about two and a half billion people. And so I wonder how that'll play out. What kind of challenges will that make? Could future world wars be based on beef? So this population growth is going to change, and it's not going to happen in a way that you think it's going to happen. Because the mature markets, the rich world, if you will, their fertility is declining. In fact, almost every major economy in the world is below replenishment rate. So that means that they are not having enough births to offset their, their um, deaths. And so the challenge to this growing population is that the growth is going to happen in parts of the world that are the least capable of handling it. It'll put extraordinary strain on systems and infrastructure, places that have no government, no institutions, no guidelines to, to work through this path. The rest of the world will be rapidly aging. The United Nations actually tells us that the aging population will be one of the greatest social and economic challenges that we face. There's one scientist in the world today that actually would tell you that the first person to live to be 150 years of age has already been born. I'm very proud to have my two daughters with me today. They're eight and 10. And I wonder, will they be one of those people that live to be 150 years of age? What will their quality of life be? But as you deal with an aging population, even in the immediate term, you have real economic implications. The economists call it the dependency ratio. How many workers do you have support the non-workers? Places like Japan are already upside down. They have the oldest population worldwide, so they have 108 retirees for every 100 workers. So as that situation persists, their economic output will decline, their savings rate will, will decline, and so they'll lose social and political influence around the world. So who's gonna take their place? Lots of people think it'll be China. I mean, China has this robust economy that's just moving along, but China's also getting older. So much so that they have this strategic imperative that they find a way to grow rich before they grow old. Because after decades of social engineering through the one-child policy, they have what's called as the 421 dilemma. Every child born into China will eventually be responsible for two parents and four aging grandparents. It's unsustainable. Um, China is an interesting example because of the one-child policy. They have this history of preferring boys over girls. And so their gender balance is um, greatly off kilter. They have about 118 girls for 118 boys for every 100 girls. Ironically, though, it's never been a better time to be a woman in China. I find it quite interesting because there aren't enough women to marry. And so China has their own version of the Bachelorette. And on one of the competitions, they had um, they had a girl. They went through the competition. And the young man who won the girl's heart told her at the end, "I can't wait to take you around on my bike. I'm so eager to let you meet my friends and my family. I'll take you everywhere. We'll spend all of our days together." And much to everyone's surprise, she turned him down. She famously said, "I would be. I would rather be crying in the back of Mercedes than laughing on the back of your bike." Because he just wasn't economically fit. 
But women will change the world. So I want to talk about the midterm view. So this will be now the 50,000 foot view of the world. The rise in influence of women is undeniable and it's a global epidemic and it's really exciting because women have renewed access to education. In fact, today there are more women attending colleges like Harvard, Columbia, um, Penn than men. And across the board in terms of bachelor's degrees, master's, master's degrees and PhDs, women are outnumbering men in every single category. And this is leading to, yay, go girl power. <laughs> and this is leading to more and more career opportunities. Even in emerging parts of the world, we have some governments that actually pay their family a stipend if they can guarantee that their daughters will graduate from high school. And since the doors aren't readily open for the career opportunities for women, they have a really strong entrepreneurial spirit. One of my favorite statistics comes from the micro-lending industry, where they're finding that women are more likely to pay back loans than men. So many of them have opted only to give loans to women. And what will happen? How will our world form? if women are in charge. And the economy will continue this way in part because as we move from a manufacturing economy, which is about skilled labor and technology, and move to a creativity science, uh, technology, we know that women generally do better in the skills of collaboration, originality, peer discussions, and communication. So it's likely we'll see that continue to change. Another area that, that I'm thinking about in this 50,000 foot view, if you will, is information. So I talk about information addiction, and information addiction is, we're all familiar with it, it's having our, our, ha our uh, information at our fingertips in a just-in-time fashion, and we're drawn to it because it means we're better able to control our environments, we're presented with more opportunities, and we can influence the world around us. And the more this proves to be true, the more addicted we become to it. But some people are quite worried about information addiction. In fact, China is so worried about information addiction, they say that 70 or 80 percent of their young people are afflicted with web addiction. And this is a threat to both their health and their national security. And so they have web addiction clinics to try to cure people. And up until about two and a half years ago, their treatment included um, electric shock therapy. Now, they're not the only country that deals with this. And the US have their own rehab clinics. They don't, they use, of course, different methods. But the break in terms of the social infrastructure, what happens when you stop communicating? At TED, the TED conference this year, one of my favorite talks was presented by an MIT professor named Shuri Turkle. And she used to be at the forefront of the, of the internet in pioneering you know, how this would work and all the great things that would come from it. But she said technology actually could be quite danger for, dangerous for us in the future because we use technology as a friend without any of the responsibilities of friendship. She said, it's become socially acceptable to only listen to the parts of the discussion that interest us. I mean, board members, members actually sit in meetings and will look down and scan through their phone and look up only when they think that part is, the parts are relevant to them. So this is a huge challenge. But the greater issue, and the one that spoke to me the most, is that we use this technology to avoid isolation and loneliness. So how many of you have ever been in a room surrounded by people that you didn't know, and rather than go up and engage them, you look to your phone to see, has anyone called me? Have I received any text? And so if we do this, we become uncomfortable with loneliness. And with loneliness and isolation is where introspection, insight, creativity, and innovation are born. So how will this bear out in the future? I don't know. In the near term, there are other challenges that we'll face as we move kind of closer and closer in terms of time frame. So I want to move down to what we'll call the 10,000 foot view, the things that are most local or near term. I get a lot of questions about the economy, and there are people in the business that really, they can't wait for the economy to recover. And when it does, we hope that we go back to our consumption-oriented ways. But I believe that the era of excess is over. And I think it's over for lots of different reasons, partly because the baby boomers who ushered the era of excess into um, culture today are actually moving to a time where they'd rather streamline, simplify their life, and the other generations are following. I take heart by the fact that millennials actually care much more about access than ownership. It used to be that if you rented or borrowed something, it was like secondhand, it wasn't as good. But lots of people just say, I don't care if I own it, as long as I have access to it where and when I need it. And this could change the whole future of consumption. Maybe we will become a much more collaborative society. Maybe we'll live in communities that share lawn mowers, snow blowers, um, other assets. Maybe return to our commune roots of the 60s. I don't know. 
I can't tell you if any of these things will play out. I just know that as we think about the future, that we have to consider all the possibilities. And these are just a small, small glimpse of some of the things that should inform your discussion. The constant, that the future is a moving target. It's constantly changing. And even during the length of my conversation, things have come into play that will change the future. And so I like to say that the stories about the future are never finished. They'll be forever continued. So when they introduced me today, they said that I've been to many TED Talks. And um, I have been really blessed by attending many. I think uh, seven in California, three TEDx's. Um, and so it's really exciting to, to get that new information. But I broke one of the golden rules of um, attending a TED conference, and I came here without any business cards. So I hope that you'll stay in touch with me, that you'll continue the dialogue, and you'll help me explore the future. Thank you for your time.